Look at this, guys. You see that? You see this ancient casica? What they want to call the moor with the emerald clusters. Quick video today, guys. Going to show you some interesting history behind this uh, little statue right here. Part of this famous collection in Dresden, Germany. As you guys saw, there was a little article here in this uh, little video as well. And uh, we're going to read from that article real quick. Before I begin, real quick, just want to give a shout out to uh, Tasha She. I saw this first right here in uh, her shorts videos. A while uh, back, she posted this August 26, 2022. And I uh, letting everybody know, you know, this is Chief Saturiona of the Temiqua Indians. All right. So shout out to Tasha She. I also saw this uh, recently on Wild West Los Angeles. I guess he posted it August 26, too. You know, I just want to say, you know, I'm not here to steal anybody's work. Just want to be able to share this with everybody. <laughs> I saw a comment here. It says, at the legend, you're stealing my work. I made video three years ago on Florida indigenous history and the Timupa chief and Moorish. All right. So, you know, I don't, you know, I don't own the info. I don't think any of us own the info. I just want to be able to share it. So I hope any, none of these uh, brothers, and sisters feel like I'm stealing their information. I just want to be able to share it with everybody. Who didn't know about these uh, channels or platforms or the video and information itself you know so again the treasures of the dresden's green vault all right very famous uh collection this uh in germany and you know one of their most prized collections is this fellow right here okay we're gonna read a little bit about who he may be right what they are really representing Without no conjectures, we're talking about history. We're not talking about beliefs. He's called the Moor with the Emerald Cluster. Dating from 1724 in the jewel room of the Green Vault in Dresden. This photo was taken in 2006. Okay. But most people will be like, yeah, that's a Moor right there. That's an African. Oh, really? So the whole point of the video to this is to show, you know, more historical breakdown of who this uh, might represent more so we're going to go into the uh, metropolitan museum journal volume 15 from 1980 pages 203 to 210 the journal article is called the graphic sources for the moor with the emerald cluster this was written by helmut nickel 
the curator of arms and armor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and says here, among the treasures from the Grunz Gewulbi, all right, that's what it's really called, brought to this country with the lone exhibition, the splendor of Dresden, the Moor Midr Smartmutit, <laughs> the Moor with the Emerald Cluster, was one of the more eye-catching pieces, even in that dazzling array. The Moor is represented as muscular youth and swaggering stride. He is carved from pear wood and lacquered a deep brown. His broadly smiling face, with its wide blunt nose and full lips, is clearly meant to be that of a Negro. But his curly hair, when seen from the front, almost entirely hidden by a jeweled gold feather crown of a type generally associated with romantic images of American Indians. All right? Oh, you'd think he was a so-called Negro, but actually he looks more like what an American Indian was represented like. All right. So, you know, Dr. Hijack, they're saying it can't be the same. A Negro can be an American Indian. So Dr. Hijack, because you know, that's wrong. Continue says the Moors dark brown skin is covered on arms, legs and body with intricate tattoos, meticulously produced by thousands of tiny dots of blue, black lacquer paint. In splendid contrast to this dark background stands forth the lavish assortment of gem-studded jewelry, necklace, pectoral armlets, knee bands, cuffs, and greaves, and a belt heavily loaded with pendants to form a fringed skirt. Again, a fringed skirt fringes. The more carries a tray of tortoise shell containing a matrix of emeralds. This was presented to Elector Augustus, 1553. The 86, the founder of the Dresden Kunstkammer, in 1560, by his friend Emperor Rudolf II in 1581. When Augustus paid him a visit on Prague soon after Rudolf's recovery from a serious illness, the emeralds were kept in a black box lined with crimson velvet and were catalogued under the section Precious Stones, Unicorn, and Rhinoceros Horns. They were said to have come from the Indies of the West, probably Muso and Colombia, and had presumably been sent to Europe by some Spanish conquistador. All right, so they're talking about what's on the statue itself was actually come from Colombia, possibly the actual emeralds and the stones on it. So here's a picture they have in this article. You guys can see. All right. This is like a different one right here. This is called the Moor with the Crystal Cluster. All right. Most likely representing, again, <laughs> American Indian. We're going to see that the gear is the same, exact same, all right? We got a couple other ones here. This is the Moor with the Pearl Cluster. And what they have here says how ceremonies are performed by Saturiona when he wants to war against his enemies. From Theodore de Brie, Historia America. What they're going to talk about, if you guys pay attention, is the tattoos of Saturiana. You know, I might be saying the name wrong. In Wikipedia, Saturiwa, also spelled Saturiona, Saturiona, and Saturiba. All right, we're going to read about him. What are they talking about, huh? Was a chief of the Saturiwa tribe, a Tamukwa chiefdom. All right, we're going to have future videos on all these tribes. Centered at the mouth of St. John's River in Florida during the 16th century, his main village, also known as Saturiwa, was located on the south bank of the river near its mouth. And according to French sources, he was sovereign over 30 other village chiefs. Chief Saturiwa was a prominent figure in the early days of European settlement in Florida, forging friendly relations with the French Huguenot settlers. Okay, who's the Huguenots? Yeah, the Huguenots were Moors that had fled from the Spanish Inquisition and settled in southern France and became known as the Huguenots. Check out my past videos on that. We have shown the sources and the genealogy. Who founded Fort Caroline, all right? They were friendlies with him, all right? Those were his friends. We're going to get into another article about him and, and that relationship with the Huguenots and the history. We've actually gone over it before a little bit. Chief Saturiwa led the Saturiwa chiefdom in what is now Jacksonville, Florida. When French Huguenots under Jean Ribault explored the area in 1562, his people came into direct contact with the French when Fort Caroline was built by René Goulan de Lano de. All right, remember, we've gone over who these people are in previous videos. All right, make sure to check those videos out. Um, very good information. The largest and best attested of the Timuqua subgroups known as the Mokama 
The Satori will occupy an area from the mouth of St. John's towards what is now downtown Jacksonville and up and down the adjacent Atlantic coast of San Agustin, north of the St. Mary's River. All right, so that's just a little brief history about them, okay? And again, here's a drawing, <laughs> all right? So again, the tattoos, exact same tattoos as the Moor with the Emerald Clusters. And we're going to see that Timuqua, actually, he decked out in gold too. They don't show him in this, but he also had the same gold plates and arm breasts and all that just like the more so-called more all right back in the article i want to read down here it says in the splendor of dresden it is mentioned following a suggestion i had made to joaquin menzausen that the moors tattoos and feather crown were taken from contemporary illustrations of travel accounts and that the figure is supposed to represent an american Indian, okay? An American Indian. We're not talking about an African Moor. Indeed, almost every detail of the adornments of all four statues has a common source. A series of engravings of the New World by Theodore de Brie, okay? All the Moors we just saw, those statues, they're all American Indians. Among de Brie's illustrations to René de Lanadier's report about the abortive French settlement in Florida in 1564, we find the exact model for the Moors tattoos, the exact model, again, the exact model for the Moors tattoo in those of the powerful king called Saturiona. That's who they're representing, guys, you see? It's an American Indian, the so-called Moor. And we read earlier, right? It's no doubt he's supposed to represent a so-called Negro. That's what they said earlier, right? An exact model, actually, of the powerful king called Saturiona. The statue's characteristic pectorals of two overlapping discs, their armlets and knee bands composed of oval discs, their belts with shirt-like fringes. All right, again, fringes of oval pendants hanging from straps. We see on braves in the opposing army, that of Olata Utina, considered the king of kings. Listen to that. All right, Wutina. We're going to read about what happened to Wutina. All right, and the French Huguenots. The armlets and knee bands worn by the Braves have also been used as models for necklaces and for ankles and bracelets. All right. So, real quick, this is a drawing. This is what they're talking about. Look at the plates. Look at the bracelets, the gold bracelets, the gold plates, and the feet. Everything just like the so called more with the emerald clusters. This is what they're letting you know. And they got the exact same tattoos, all right, as those so called moors and those statues that they got over there in Germany. They're representing American Indians, guys. Wake up. Stop misclassifying people. Stop Africanizing everybody. And stop labeling everybody a moor. They had a name and they had a nation name. These are the Timuqua. They didn't call themselves Moors. They called themselves something else. The rectangular wrist guard worn by the archer marching in the van of Olata Utina's host, however, has been misunderstood by the goldsmith. In the breeze engraving, it is shown quite correctly on the inside of the left wrist as a protection against the snap of the bowstring. In the trappings of the Moor with the emeralds, though this bracer has been taken for a peculiar Indian adornment, it appears on both forearms turned outward to boot as a bracelet and even on the lower legs as a kind of griefs. All right. So it wasn't just like, you know, because he wanted to bling bling is what they're saying. It was actually for protection. All right. These so-called bracelets. In a similar way, the skirted breech plot of the warrior on the left wearing the skin of a mountain lion seems to have served as a model for the belts with pendants worn by the statuettes. They all have a large triangular flap in front that of the moor with the emeralds is hidden under the tray, okay? Again, they're letting you know they're breaking down everything about the statues and it all represents American Indians. This is an adaptation of the breech clot with its turnover in front. The rear flaps were added by the goldsmith, probably for symmetry, because the breech clots in the debris prints are simply knotted in back. Another variant is that the pendants hanging from the belts of three of the statuettes, all right, are interspersed with looped bands. In the more with the crystal cluster, however, the pendants are connected by a pair of parallel straps, exactly like those of Debris Warriors, okay? The double disc 
pectorals of the two great moors modeled after the breast ornament of the breeze archer are suspended by two jeweled straps over their shoulders. These straps cross each other and back with this at the crossing points and are attached to the belts. The two small moors have cross straps running up from their belts in front and in the rear with double disc in front and single disc in back. In the engravings, no such harness appear. Their pectoral discs are simply hung from a band around the wearer's neck. In the arrangement of the pectorals and particularly in the strap work of the belt of the moor, with the crystals, the two great moors are much closer to the breeze illustration than the smaller pair with the pearl clusters. This can mean only that the great moors were taken directly from the graphic sources, okay? They were taken directly from these graphic sources of debris, which was American Indians, guys. And that the small statues were made later. They were made later, as indicated in the inventor Prestos in 1725. However, there is no direct prototype among debris engravings for the headdresses worn by the great moors. At first glance, their feather crowns look like the standard plumbed ornaments associated with American Indians from the earliest woodcut illustrations on. But on closer observation, it becomes clear that there is a curious tongue-shaped extension rising from the middle of the burrow band. This pointed projection is quite different from the other round-tipped feathers. It is practically identical to the jeweled tongue that juts up from the feathered headdress of the allegorical figure of America, okay? In the Tapestry series of the Four Continents. Okay, we have videos on that. Remember the paintings on the Germany uh, buildings and the walls where they're painting the Four Continents, how they represent America. You guys saw the videos. If you haven't checked those out, you know, again, they're letting you know all, everything that's in the statue. Everything symbolizes America or an American Indian. The models for this peculiar headdress must have been the diadem of the emperors of Mexico at the time of the conquest, okay? Usually called Copili, the diadem's other name, Shihuitzotli, all right? So you see how they combine a lot of different things of American Indian chiefs, and they put it in that one uh, statuette, all right? They're calling it a moor. Now you want you to think it's from Africa and all that. You know, got to dodge the hijack. You guys see what they're letting us know here, right? This is the curator of the museum. The jewel-encrusted pointed peak, okay? The Copili offers a fair description of its shape and nature. The Shui Soli was part of the name glyph of Montezuma. And it is to be found in countless 16th century illustrations identifying this monarch. The breeze engravings were based on original watercolor drawings by Jax Lemoyne, who had accompanied Lano Deer, all right? So it wasn't even the Breeze uh, creation. He copied it. It was actually the Huguenots who had drawn them, the Huguenots, okay? Who were also so-called Moors. A point that is duly mentioned in the Ferra Jabent edition of the Breeze work. This guarantee of authenticity must have been a decisive element in the choice of a Florida chieftain's trappings augmented by the similarly authentic headdress of Moctezuma and America herself for the image of the more carrying emeralds from the Indies of the West. Okay. It's of America. All right. And the headdress of Moctezuma with the other gear of Saturnalia. Okay. And his tattoos and everything. You guys understand what we just read. All right. You guys understand how they hijack history. You see how they Africanized everything. They've been teaching us all these years that more meant Africa and all this other stuff and that those statues are just Moors, 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 Moors. And now you see there's a specific history behind these statues, who they represented, and it was American Indians and America itself. So shout out to everybody that shared this knowledge before me. I just wanted to share this with everybody else. Hope you guys enjoyed this uh, quick video. We're going to have a lot more with uh, Saturnalia and the Temuco and all these nations down here. We're going to discover a lot of tribes in these areas of Southeast America and the rest of North America. Thanks for tuning in again. Make sure to take care of yourselves. Thanks for all the support, guys. Much love to my Patreons for holding me up. Be blessed. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Wow.